this is how to freelance for UX researchers. Um, uh, and this is our session one. I mean, I, I ran this a few months ago and we ran all five sessions as kind of one thing, but this time we decided to just do it um, individually, to just break them out one at a time. And uh, so this is session one, there will be four others, each one coming a month later, uh, which is another difference. When I ran it before we ran one a week, and it wasn't quite enough time to do what you needed to do in the interim. And so having a month between hopefully will give you a little more time to do some, if you choose to do some of the things that, um, that you need to do to progress toward freelancing. Anyway, so session one, the others are coming. You're invited to them if you're interested. Um, and so let's, um, let's move on. So, let me start with my intro. We kind of did a little brief intro from all of you. Um, this is my family and, and me, my wife of 27 years, our four sons. Um, we met and have lived in the Bay Area our whole lives. But a few years ago, we moved to Utah. So I'm no longer in the San Francisco Bay Area, but I live in Utah. And, um, and this is my why. Um, Freelancing offers you flexibility and an opportunity to do to put some things a higher priority than work. And um, this is well, I'm sorry. This is my highest priority, and I've been self-employed for many years, so it's given me the flexibility to put my family first, which is um, which has been a real joy for me. Um, okay, so are you ready to freelance? Um, I mean, hopefully you're going to be answering this question as we go along today. Um, freelancing is starting your own business. It's a choice that only you can make. And really, the success is up to you um, uh, if you choose to do it. But there's some steps that, um, that hopefully will make it easier and more predictable. Success, more predictable. Um, so those other sessions come. So tonight's kind of an eval session. We'll be talking although about a lot of principles of freelancing. Um, session two in September is about creating your plan for freelancing. Um, <laughs> planning ahead helps, <laughs> like with everything else. Session three is marketing your services. That is really a critical part. Session four is establishing a legal entity, like how you want to do business as an LLC, as a sole proprietor. And then session five is about bidding um, managing books, benefits, some of those kinds of things. So those are the sessions later on if, if you're interested. Okay, so why learn about freelancing in this environment? Of course, there are a lot of YouTube videos. You can just go online and basically learn anything you want <laughs> these days. But it's powerful to do it in context with a whole group that's doing it. Um, there's a lot of learning that comes from each other, which is very valuable. Um, I'm going to suggest if you are interested in doing the whole series of classes, that you choose a partner in the class and that you work together. An accountability partner can be very powerful. <laughs> Someone in my last session at one point in the series said, you know, these are all things I meant to do for months, <laughs> but I just never got around to them. And so hopefully doing it in this context with a group of others that are doing it gives you some motivation, gives you good ideas with an accountability partner, helps keep you on track. And, and then finally, um, the Researchers Guild is a community. And, and if you choose to freelance, you can be part of that community. You can be part of that community without freelancing, but freelancing can be very isolating. And so having a community you're part of can make it less isolating, less lonely, um, less difficult because you're doing it together with others. So anyway, um, those are all advantages of not doing it alone, but doing it with others. All right, so here's our agenda for tonight, um, what we're going to be talking about. So I like to bring a guest into each call. I, and um, 
But for tonight's guest, I liked the guest I had a few months ago so well that we're going to go through parts of her recording because she really brought out a lot of great content. And so she'll be our special guest. Um, and at one point, we're going to do a breakout session um, to let you process some of what we go through right now. So um, with another person, you'll just break out in pairs and have a chance to sort of do a self-assessment. So I guess, so you know that's coming. We're going through all these areas where you can assess yourself, the strength of your research skills, the strengths of your networks, um, and then your kind of personal readiness. And so when we do that breakout session, you can, it's a chance for you to just verbalize to another person your assessment of where you are in those three areas, um, which is helpful. Uh, once again, sometimes it's verbalizing in another person is more powerful than just <laughs> having it in your head and thinking about it. Okay, so onward. So first of all, freelancing, um, let's contrast employment and freelancing briefly. Employment, when you take a job, I'm going to get my snazzy laser pointer for this. When, when you take a job, basically you're signing on to your employer's industry, whatever products they have, their mission, to pursue their mission according to their values. Um, you're a member of their team, assuming they have one. The employer has a certain amount of control if you're an employee over where, when, and how you work. But there's a huge benefit to being an employee, which is the employer basically guarantees your work. They, if you sign on, they guarantee we'll have a steady stream of work with, for you until you quit or if you're, heaven forbid, let go. When. Um, and they'll pay you a salary and benefits. <laughs> And those are, those are, of course, wonderful guarantees to come from employment. Freelancing is in some ways the mirror image. You, you don't have to sign on to someone else's industry and products. You have control over that. You choose every client and you can choose the industries and projects that you accept. You pursue your own mission and your own, with your own values. Um, so that's a big bonus, like my family, being able to elevate my family in importance. You're solo now, and of course, that's really a two-edged sword. There are a whole lot of advantages to working slow, solo. You know, a team can slow you down, but of course, teams have other expertise, <clears throat> so you don't have the benefit of that when you're on your own. Um, you're also free to work when and where and how you want. That's a huge advantage. Um, you set your own rates. I mean, but, but now let's talk about the big difficulty of freelancing. You have to find your own work. It doesn't, no one's guaranteeing it to you. There's no guaranteed salary, of course. And that for most people is the most difficult part of freelancing finding a steady stream of clients to keep you busy. Uh, another minor challenge can be benefits. If, if you no longer have access to company, medical, dental benefits, then what? So, um, so I tried to think of this in terms of an equation and like, okay, what are all the pluses and what are the minuses to help you make this decision? Like, do I want to freelance? I mean, you wouldn't be on this call if it wasn't something you were intrigued about and thinking about. So, um, so if having that control over your clients, pursuing your own mission and values, working solo, freedom to work as you choose, setting your own rates, if all of that is greater than the difficulty of finding work, including preparing the bids and the contracts and losing the guarantee of salary and benefits, if this side is greater, then freelancing may make sense. If this side is greater, then maybe it doesn't. Maybe you're better off with a salary and benefits and an employer that's guaranteeing you your work. Anyway, that's one way to think about it. So let's kind of dive into a quick assessment of different areas you might be thinking about 
to determine, are you ready? And is this the right thing for you? Um, and first would be your research skills. Um, so, you know, how do you evaluate them? <laughs> Each person just has their own experience. You know, they've worked for their employers, their teams, but, but let's sort of see if we can um, talk about some of the aspects, different ways that you can look at your skills. Um, you know, how many years have you worked in research? At what level have you attained as a researcher? Um, and to be a freelancer, you certainly should be confident in your skills and able to work alone because that's, that's basically the life of a freelancer. Um, what's the breadth and depth of your experience? Well, that you know depends on what you've had an opportunity to work in. Should, is it better to be broad? Is it better to be deep? That's a great question to ask, and we'll go into that at, at some point. But at this point, you're just assessing, you know, how broad are my skills and in what areas are they deep? You know, what product areas have you done devices, services, you know, business to business or consumer? Um, what are the methods you're most familiar with in researching? Um, and then tools. And, um, and I would say these are kind of in hierarchical importance, right? Your experience, these bottom areas are not nearly as important as the upper areas, like the tools, you know, obviously you can learn new tools quickly. Um, so, I mean, another issue for freelancers is can you apply what you know to other industries and products? Because you'll probably be called upon to do that. And are you comfortable doing that? Um, are you comfortable switching between one? The beauty of employment is you just have the same products. <laughs> You're facing the same challenges for years at a time, depending on how you how long you stay with a client, uh, with an employer. But in freelancing, you're often switching, you know, every few weeks. Uh, some some freelancers actually like to switch, juggle multiple projects at a time. There's some good reasons to do that. Um, so are you comfortable with that? Because that can be challenging for some people. I mean, that's harder to juggle multiple studies instead of just one and keep one set of products, you know, in your mind at one time, one set of end users, et cetera. Okay, anyway, so your research skills, you know, what's, when you go out into the, when we do the breakout, I want you to try to rate your skills from say one to 10 and say, well, I, I think if 10 is this super experienced person, you know, where am I along that continuum? Okay, next. Next is your ability to find work, uh, which I've mentioned is, is probably the most, is, is the most challenging thing for most freelancers. So let's have, one way to look at this is to evaluate your networks. And one net, the first and most important network is your in-person network. You know, are you well-known and liked at, you know, your current and past jobs? Do you have colleagues who know and respect you? Are you active in terms of, you know, meetings and events? You're here tonight. That's good. Um, do you volunteer in any, any, in any organizations? Because it turns out that is a great way to, um, to get exposure, experience, to build relationships. I know a lot of people who have started as, who have volunteered for a time with uh, an organization, and that allowed them to launch a freelancing career with UXPA or some other group, that alone, you know, a year or two of that kind of work allowed them to do that. Sasha, I know you volunteered with UXPA, which is awesome. That's good. Um, I mean, really, the bottom line is how many of the research hiring managers know you and could hire you, would hire you? Um, so the ideal is that there are some who are willing to hire you and that they're colleagues who also would recommend you, you know, who you've worked with before. And if their company needs a freelancer, they'd say, hire Sasha, let's, let's hire her. Okay, so that's your in-person network. And I feel that's the most important one because those people really know you, they've worked with you. The strength of those relationships is, is, is great. But online networks, of course, are very important too. So, you know, you should, these are important to cultivate. Um, 
So, you know, just some ideas of, of what's your level of activity and, you know, how many followers do you have? Um, I guess, you know, if you haven't been active before, contemplating, contemplating freelancing may, <laughs> you may decide you want to be more active than you've been before online. Um, you know, you may want to be somewhat more consistent about posting and kind of cultivating your, your persona as a researcher online. Um, because the, the point of this is managers who, who don't know you, helping them get to know you and want to work with you. So, so I would say that's the thing to keep in mind in terms of your online activities, you know are people who are in a position of hiring, seeing what you're doing, respecting it, and thinking, hey, that's a person, you know, we'd be interested in hiring. Okay, so those are the two, those are two ways to think of your networks, in person, online. Of course, there are a lot of other ways you could think about those connections, but that's one way. Um, and now, I so, I think there are three main considerations. One's your work experience, your research abilities, two are your networks, and three, I'm just gonna call personal. We're just gonna lump all, all of it together in personal. And so we're gonna look at some of those personal consideration for, considerations for freelancing now. Um, freelancing is you're taking on greater personal responsibility and risk if you're a freelancer. Um, so is this the right time for you to do that? Um, if you're, if you're thinking of buying or refinancing a house, it's not a great time to start freelancing because lenders would prefer the stability of employment. Once you freelance for a year and you have a track record, um, if your income is similar to employment, then, then they look on that similarly. But, um, but to start it, it would jeopardize your financing a house if you start freelancing before that. Um, what are you going to do for you know medical and dental insurance? Are there any health issues that you're worried about? Do you have obligations that take a ma major portion of your time? Um, not that you can't do it with these obligations, but you should factor them in and think about them. Um, do you have the energy to start something new? It takes a lot of energy to start to start a business. <laughs> and that's what you're doing when you're freelancing. So, um, you know, do you have that energy? Um, ideally, you have the time, the resources, the energy to start a business. You have access to benefits. Oh, sorry about that. Um, as we'll hear from our guest a little bit later, part of what gave her the confidence, the ability to launch into freelancing when she was laid off. Her husband, she, she's married and she had access to benefits and also his paycheck to sort of support them. So, um, uh, so that can be um, a real help. You can take more risk if you've got stability somewhere, if you're getting stability somewhere. Um, okay. and. The one area to look at in particular is finances, because basically, what are you going to do if you start freelancing and you don't replace your full-time income, what will you do? Um, that's an important question to answer. Do you have savings or are you in debt and, <laughs> and you're paying off things from the past? Um, do you have the financial discipline to be a freelancer, you know, to spend less than you make? It takes a lot more discipline to manage freelance finances than employment. In employment, they withhold your taxes. You never see them <laughs> and send them to the government for you. And the employer withholds their portion. You, of course, have to do those things on your own when you're a freelancer. So sometimes you'll get a big chunk of money and you need to have the discipline to set it aside for taxes and things like that. Um, Okay, so ideal, <laughs> the ideal is to have high discipline, low debt, low expenses, you know, low obligations, and ideally some savings to um, help you through. Okay, so, um, okay, 
what are your goals? Well, you can also ask yourself why you want to freelance, why now? Um, what are some of the things that bring you satisfaction and meaning in your work? Do, do you do any of your goals require a team or a company budget? Do you want to move into management? You know, freelancing will change that. And so you want to make sure it's aligned with your goals. Um, although I'll say one other thing, which is it's actually somewhat fluid to cross in and out of freelancing. Um, you know, you can freelance for a couple of years and then take a full-time job again. So it doesn't mean you'll never do these things. I mean, you're choosing not to do them for the time you're freelancing, but, you know, you may not freelance till the end of your career. You may do it for a couple of years while conditions are suitable for you, and then it's fine to go back into employment. Um, okay, so in prepping for this breakout session, let's, I'm just going to stop this share for a second. Any questions about what we've covered so far um, that we can handle together? And then we'll do a breakout where you can sort of talk individually. But any questions about assessing your research skills, assessing your networks, your ability to find work, assessing your personal situation? And are you, you know, are you ready to freelance? Okay, and if, I mean, if, you know, you kind of get put to sleep watching a PowerPoint and having someone talk. Um, anyway, any question anyone wants to come forward with? If, if not, I'll just let you kind of talk this over in a breakout session and um, oh. go ahead. Um, Bobby has a hand up. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, please um, go ahead, Bobby. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Um, so one of the things I thought was very curious is um, what I like to do. I, I'm I've only been a UX researcher for a year, but I have over 20 years experience in the UX field, and I like to really volunteer for a lot of nonprofits um, in the Middle Tennessee area. And so part of my intrigue is um, the tools and access to tools for user testing. So like um, currently at my position, we use uh, user Zoom for a lot of our surveys, our usability testing and things like that. And I just was curious from a freelance standpoint, what kind of tools like that are are used because you know some of those products are, you know, and tools are quite expensive. Um, so as a freelancer, that's something I was very curious, especially from a research, because a big part of that research is interacting with users a lot of times and having those um, studies done. Uh, great question. Great question. Um, I would say uh, um, a lot of clients, if they expect you to use the tool they're using or repository or whatever, they'll give you access to it. I'd say that's the most common scenario. If they don't, and it's up to you, um, then you can choose your preferred tools. And, um, you know, sometimes you subscribe to a tool just during a study. Um, uh, Optimal Workshop is one that this guest mentions that she uses from time to time. And she'll subscribe for three months while she's doing a study for a client and then quit. You know, it's a couple hundred dollars a month for a few months and then she'll stop using it. So, um, so if it's the big fancy platforms, the client has to provide them, right? You can't afford those as an individual researcher, but so they probably will. And otherwise you find other tools that you learn to work with, that you enjoy, that you know, you're able to do, that you're able to use to conduct the studies. Um, May I ask a follow-up to that? Please. Uh, so is it kind of uh, within like the freelance realm is, um, yeah, I'm not very familiar with too many tools such as, uh, like you mentioned, Optimal Workshop, but is this also a case where a lot of like moderated um, tests are done so you can record it via Zoom or whatever platform to do like screen recordings and things like that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'd say the, the most common research method is um, is interviews and, you know, moderated or unmoderated interviews, but um, yeah, recording those interviews, note taking, um, you can do some of those things 
you know, on the fly with your own note taker, listening in on sessions, if you don't have some of the tools that other big organizations have. Okay, please. Uh, Danielle? Um, okay. Uh, yeah, on that note, if you are buying the expensive software, would would you recommend, um, Raymond, to put it like put it under your name and your company and then have the client reimburse you or have the client buy it and then add you as a user? That's what you prefer. I think either one could work. I mean, typically the client has the software they prefer. The reason they want you to use it is they their whole team's using it and they just want you on the same platform. So in that case, they provision a license for you and now you're able to use the same platform. Um, but, but in the case where they say, okay, we need you to go make an expenditure to do this project, I would just work it into your bid for them. And say, it's, it's gonna cost $2,000 to use this platform. I'm just going to bill it through to you. You know, just agree in advance that that's what you're going to do. I don't see any advantage to putting it in their company name. You know, you might as well put it on your own. You might be able to use it for other clients or projects during the time that you have it. You know, there may be some advantage to your having access to this tool for a time and you can make, you know, take advantage of that. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, no problem. Yeah, the most thing is just, the most important thing is just, having an agreement uh, who's going to co cover the cost if they're dictating a specific tool that you need to use. Yeah. In my case, I'm the only, I'm the first UX researcher for this group. So there's a lot of firsts that we're, I'm introducing and it's my first client. So it's <laughs> kind of flirting as I go. Okay. You know, that's a great point. I'm sorry for assuming, you know, kind of big company, big teams, big tools sure enough well i guess that's what got me thinking of it are these expensive platforms that cost tens of thousands they of dollars really are. yeah all of them are expensive yeah and so um yeah the small companies have to be scrappy in the way they conduct these studies and get their information okay any other questions before we do a breakout okay so here i'm just going to share my slide oh go ahead amy please yeah i have a question um it might be a stupid question but i'm just something that is on my mind is like how much, I guess, could you expect to rely on like finding contract or freelance like job positions online versus like relying on your network? I just like I have a network. It's just like I'm wondering, you know, they're not always going to have projects. They might not have the need like that makes me nervous, I guess. So I just be curious to hear. <laughs> That's the big issue of freelancing. That should make you nervous. <laughs> that will make you nervous every day as a freelancer. Um, I, I would say you can't rely on your online network as much as you can your in-person network. I mean, the people who know you, trust you, have worked with you before, you're five times more likely to get work with them than uh, you know than on than from someone who doesn't know you online who's discovered you. So. So a big part of the preparation for freelancing is building that network of people who know you and trust you and want to work with you. Yeah, that's okay, a big thanks. part of it. Okay, no problem. Okay, so we're going to do a, a, about a 10-minute breakout. Let me just pull this slide up to remind you what you're doing. You're, you are going to self-assess and say, well, here are my research skills. Here are my networks. Here's my personal ready, you know, here's my self-assessment of my personal readiness. And then, you know, the other person could be a sounding board for you if you want them to, but also you're just verbalizing yourself, which is probably the most powerful thing. Here's where I think I am, you know, one to 10 in these three areas. And, and when you come back, if there's something you want to share or a question you have from that, feel free. We'll give you about 10 minutes meaning each of you has about five minutes to kind of go through these three areas for the other person. I realize it's a complete stranger, <laughs> but uh, hopefully that's helpful to be able to verbalize it to another person. And of course, take a, a minute to get to know each other better, introduce yourselves um, before you launch into this. And 
when the session's going to end, you'll have a, a one minute timer telling you that, to come back and join the, you know, that you have one minute to finish before joining the group. Um, okay, so let me stop the share. Any questions before we go into doing that? You'll just randomly be assigned to a room. It most of it will be two, but maybe one will be three. So with 13 participants, I'll make it 12 rooms. I'm sorry, I'll make it six rooms. And um, let's see how you end up. If anything goes wrong, just come out of your room or message us and we'll try to reassign. But you'll be automatically assigned to a room in a moment. You need to accept the prompt. When you have a prompt to join a room, please accept the prompt. Um, okay, rooms are open. Please join. Okay. Okay, well, how was it? Good. I hope, I hope you enjoyed the person you met, whoever that was. I hope it was fruitful to talk this through a little bit. Please, who's willing to share something that they that they've come away with? Oh, oh, that was a thumbs up. <laughs> Thanks for the thumbs up. That, that was a raised hand for a minute. Anyone willing to share any insights, any thoughts? Hi, Ray, this is Tim. Uh, I thought it was really valuable to meet somebody in a different situation and just talk through that stuff. So thank you for assigning me the breakout partner I got. That worked out really well. That was, Tim, thank you. That's awesome. That was really Zoom gets the credit for the random <laughs> assignment, however that works. But... Oh, I thought you were doing it. No, <laughs> just, it was just random. But um but I guess that brings out one other thing, which is in that we've created a spreadsheet. And if you want to, you can share your information in that spreadsheet. In fact, I recommend that you do. And there are two levels here. One is just to connect with the other people. Amy, to your point of building your networks, you want to take every advantage, every chance, you know, take advantage of every opportunity to connect with other people in research. So this is an opportunity to build your network by, you know, 15 people. Um, so Janine, maybe will you post that spreadsheet in the chat? And yeah. if you want to, you can go post your information. And on one level, it just says you're open with connecting with the other people on this call. On a second level, if you want an accountability partner, then you can look among those people and decide if there's someone there who you think would be a good partner for you. And um, and start to work together to support each other in this journey to prepare and freelance. Um, okay, so Lynn will paste that, and that's a thought for you. That spreadsheet. Um, any any other comments before we go on to our guest? 
Okay, then I'm going to do share my screen. We are going to. Um, okay, you see my screen. Let me introduce our guest. This is kind of funny because she was live in a previous session, but um, let me introduce her to you. Her name is Danielle Cooley. Her own firm is DG Cooley and Company. She lives outside of Washington, D.C. She has been a researcher for about 20 years and or something over 20 years and a freelancer for about 13. So she set up her own business about 13 years ago. And um, and so there were a lot of good things in her in her recording. And I'm going to give you my my favorite chunks of that. It's about 30 minutes, but I'm going to give you a chunk of about um, 10 and five. I think I've cut it in half, but um, but hopefully preserve some of the best content. So um, so let's see if this works to share. Do you still see my screen? Do you not see a video screen queued up? We see okay. the video screen queued up. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Janine. So I'm going to play. And um, and then we may talk about some of the insights when we stop. But um, but here's a little chunk of her recording, and hopefully it's um, it's good for you. So should I go to full screen here? Let me just go to full screen and then play. Started it. So the great story is that oh. I had been. I was reviewing all this at double speed. <laughs> So let me take it back to normal speed. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, requeue. All right, great. Here we go. The story is that I had been thinking about going out on my own um, because I worked in a consulting company and realized that you know they had a lot of overhead. They had a lot of non-billable people just keeping things running. And the end client was paying for that. And of course, the work they were getting out of it was the same as if they just hired me directly. So I thought, well, I could make more money and they could save some money and get the same results. Um, oh, doggone, I'm so sorry for that. Oh. Oh. oh, I'm so sorry. I clicked off my window. Oh, here I was trying to speed things up by advancing the speed a little bit. Okay. Um, so let me just, okay, there we go. Oh, okay, Rq. <laughs> I apologize. Okay, 3205 is where we started. So we'll pick it up here. And two hours after I got back from maternity. Oh. Darn, I'm jumping to the climax of her story. They had a lot of non-billable people just keeping things running. And the end client was paying for that. And of course, the work they were getting out of it was the same as if they just hired me directly. So I thought, well, I could make more money and they could save some money and get the same results. Um, and so that, that was the thought process. And then I had my first son and figured I'll just chill on that for a few little while, you know, see how that goes. And two hours after I got back from maternity leave, I was a part of a layoff. So I said, oh, I guess I'm an independent consultant now. And I have been ever since. And the joke is that uh, my son is my mandatory white male co-founder. So He's 13. Hopefully I can put him to work soon. He can start earning some of that cred. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you about it. I enjoy it. I uh, have not yet found an in-house position compelling enough to pull me away um, in 13 years. So mostly, I guess I would just love to answer any questions you have and, and learn more about you and why you're here. Well, Danielle, I want to just point out the first thing, which is so often people go into freelance inadvertently. It's right, they aren't planning it and then choose the day, and then it just life events intervene. Mm -hmm. 
and and that sort of pushes you out of the comfortable guaranteed work and salary world and it's sink, sink or swim <laughs> it is uh, which is a nice segue into the safety net right that's always the big question is can i do this how risky is it you know i had a spouse who had group health insurance and a magical paycheck that dropped from the sky every two weeks and that was very helpful um you know we lived in a low cost of living area we didn't you know, we weren't going to lose our house or anything if I didn't find work right away. So uh, that was important. And I would say if I didn't have that, uh, I, I probably would not have become an independent consultant at that point. I would have needed more stability and, and predictability um, until I could build up more of a safety net of my own right, to do that kind of thing. Um, because it, it does also cost more than you think it will. <laughs> At least it did to me. I mean, people warn you about self-employment tax, but it's really high. And, um, you know, then you just do spend a lot of non-billable time, you know, finding the work and doing the proposals and doing the contracts and, you know, um, handling administrative duties. So it's it's not easy, but I think it's worth it. And it gets easier, right? Because then you get practice at all those things. Okay, that's a good point too. All right, well, I'm hoping we have some questions. So please uh, step forward if you've got a question. Danny. Hi, Danielle. Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, my name's Fee. I have a, my question for you is I've heard that, and I just, I'm just curious to hear your take. Sometimes people say freelancers should bill. You you talked about like non-billable hours, et cetera. So I'm, Wondering, yeah, sometimes people say, oh, you should bill by the hour versus bill by the type of project. So what's your kind of take on that? And like, does it matter? Is it a personal choice? Is there like one way UX researchers should be? So there's a lot that goes into that. That's a great question, Fane. Um, I prefer to work on a fixed fee basis where there is a project with a start and a finish and a def well-defined scope and outcome. Um, and I, what you don't get when you bill hourly is uh, really capturing the value of the knowledge that you provide, right? Uh, so as a researcher, I provide these clients with amazing insights that affect their product designs that ultimately go on to affect their bottom lines in very big ways. Uh, and because I'm so experienced, I can do that pretty quickly, right? So if I build hourly uh, for projects like that, I would, I would need to have a pretty exorbitant hourly rate really to, to make that happen. Um, but framing it more around the value of the information and the knowledge and the insights really helps, I think, to maximize um, their impression of the, the overall effort and, you know, to understand that the work we're doing is important and valuable. Um, honestly, to help the insights move into production instead of going into a drawer, uh, right? Um, that said, there are certain situations where billing hourly just makes more sense right? Like if the scope is not very well defined and it's just like, hey, we're going to try to figure out what we want to learn and what we want to do. And we're not really sure what that's going to be. And it might be this many, you know, it might be six studies or it might be one study and we just don't know yet. And I'm like, okay, well, I can help you figure that out. We can, you know, have some sort of a retainer agreement or just a pure hourly agreement. Um, I also sometimes subcontract for other consulting practices, mm -hmm. and that tends to work out better hourly, if only because they bill hourly, right? So that helps them do the math and figure out whether they can afford me, you know, to participate in the project. But generally, I absolutely advocate for um, fixed fee value-based pricing. <laughs> um, what? What kind of contracts are you getting? Um, like, what kind of activities are you doing? I'm a big fan of the fixed fee. Um, um, I, I, I haven't, I haven't been doing the freelance stuff in a while. I've, I've kind of been out game for a bit. 
So what kind of projects are you finding out there? And are you an LLC and why did you go that route? I am an LLC and I went that route because my accountant just sort of said, that's the easiest, let's do it. Uh, I do think that is not the right structure for me and I would like to change it, but that seems, you know, I just got a lot of momentum going. I've got some, uh, I'm a certified woman owned business and it's like changing the paperwork causes this cascade of other things that need to change. Um, but it may be costing me a lot of money, so I should probably figure that out. Uh, in terms of the types of projects that come up, it does vary a lot. So last, I guess it was actually 2020, uh, I did a large fixed fee project for the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and they were redesigning actually their whole site, but what they were looking for my help with was the navigation structure. And did we need to sort of reconsider the information architecture and navigation structure of the site? So uh, I proposed, uh, we ended up, you know, I, what I proposed for an ideal situation was way outside of their budget uh, that of course they didn't disclose until they said, hey, that's way outside of our budget. How, how much can you do for this much? And so we agreed on um, one to two card sorting studies, one to two tree tests to validate what came out of those card sorting studies, and then one to two, um, they called them click tests. They're basically usability studies of the prototypes that came out of those uh, NAV studies. Um, and, you know, did that. Uh, I'm also engaged now with a large healthcare client who I have done fixed fee work for in the past. But uh, right now I'm working with them just hourly to help, uh, I, I don't know, corral cats in the, <laughs> their, um, a, a variety of projects that they kind of have going all at the same time. So, and that is also for their public facing site, but it's more transactional stuff. So like how to schedule an appointment um, and then some information architecture things like finding a doctor or finding an urgent care center near you, things like that. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second and stop my share. Okay, so let's just process for a minute some of the things that you've learned from her so far. I think she commented on a number of just important issues. Tell me what you've picked up. Hey, Someone Ray, asked, oh, please. She had a support network. I think she said she had a husband and she didn't have to work, but it gave her the luxury of starting doing that freelancing. And look where it led her. She's doing really well. Um, she was making the most of the domestic resources she had. Great point. Her situation allowed her to take a risk that she couldn't have taken if she were on her own, especially because she just had a baby. <laughs> so that would not have been a time to take a risk, but it in her situation, it worked out. So yes, that's a great point. You know, what can mitigate your risk? <laughs> um, also, uh, the client had a project that um, her first proposal was at, way out of their budget, but she found a way to provide them something uh, instead of just saying, well, I can't do any work for you, um, but that would work in their budget. She told us a lot about how that bidding process works. Knowing nothing, she she gave them a big bid, <laughs> and then they came back to say, "Here's our budget." And she said, "Oh, okay, let's do this." Um, and she said, uh, "I don't know if she said here or later." Sometimes she'll just ask a client up front, "What is your budget?" And that can speed up that process. But yeah, that's a great tip on bidding. You know how she goes about it. I think also just kind of having to be flexible, whether it's a fixed rate that you're charging versus hourly because I think those are you know obviously finance is really the, a big part of if we're freelancing what we have to be thinking about and I'd love to hear more about why an LLC is maybe not the right thing because I know nothing about that <laughs> we'll have a whole session on that coming up on legal and taxes to consider both those things but frankly an LLC for most people is the ideal uh, form frankly. It's 
other than a sole proprietorship, which is how I recommend most people begin, and only when you're making a certain amount of money, say, I don't know, $70,000 or so, some significant amount of money per year as a freelancer, at that point, it makes sense to create an entity. And an LLC, for most people, is the best one. It's the cheapest. It's the easiest to maintain. It gives you tax advantages uh, that um, she may not realize she's getting. Although there's some things you need to do to get those tax advantages. Anyway, that's kind of arcane stuff. But the bigger point here was, how, how do you bill? Right? Everyone has this question. Do you bill hourly? Do you bill fixed bid? What was her preference? Fixed bid? Fixed bid. It's more profitable. She said she's fast. She's been doing it for 20 years. <laughs> so she says, well, look, the value of this project to the client is X dollars, 10,000, 50, you know, whatever it is. And, and so she'll just give them that quote and she doesn't track her hours and she works quickly and can del deliver that value in not very many hours. You know, a lot of times that's not possible, but, but that's one of the things we're going to talk about some things through this, through these different sessions. You usually start hourly and you're working your way to fixed bid. So mature freelancer, she's done it for 20 years. She's got client relationship. At that point, you're able to do fixed bid work. Your first couple of years, maybe not so much, but you kind of know where you're going. <laughs> so hourly is easier to start. You also have to be very good at estimating the job, right? To get fixed bid, you better be confident that you can do all that for $10,000. So she has that experience and that confidence. She can give that bid and deliver. Um, but that's a thing to work toward. That's a good goal to be working toward. Well, it's not only she's estimating the bid in terms of the amount of time, she's also estimating the bid in terms of what types of projects or experiment or like, you know, research is she recommending for that client as well? Yes. Like she, had, she had things listed, the card sorting, the tree sort, the uh, yeah, the tree testing and then the user testing she had that dialed as well so for mm -hmm. me as a new person that's that's harder to find what's my path at the very beginning than to lay it out and then to price it out and just get somebody to say okay uh, no clear that's one of the things her experience allows her to do knowing the client's problem she knows which methods are going to be most effective to gain the insights they need so that's that's an important thing to know as a researcher, so you know what to recommend. Um, and so while you're learning that, you might partner with another more senior researcher who can help guide that effort, you know, guide which methods are gonna be most effective to use. Okay, any other insights that anyone got from that chunk? Yeah, I, I was really curious that she has branded herself as TG Cooley and Co. I, I mean, I don't know whether she works with other people full time or it kind of makes her look like more of an agency or a, she also mentioned that it's like a woman led organization. And first, I like that because I wonder if that helps her gets to more types of organizations that she likes to work with because they're appealed to their appeal to her brand. Um, but also, I wonder if she gets to bigger organizations who can pay more because they just see her name and maybe they don't actually look into the details and see she, she's a one-man band. They just see the name of an agency and then they just don't look any further. You know, I can imagine that being the case in places like Facebook and other places. Um, okay, great insight, Sasha. She mentioned she's a woman in own business. Obviously, the only reason she is is because it's an advantage to her in bidding. Many big companies have a percentage of their spend that they want to go to women-owned, minority-owned businesses, that's a huge advantage. So um, yes, that's good of you to pick up on that. And then how she named herself, well, that would be awesome to be able to ask her how she thinks her name has played out after all these years. But yeah, DG Cooley and Co, you know, how much Co is there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, not, not much. She works remotely out of her home, you know, but yeah, but that's how she set herself up. So it's a good insight. All right, let's listen to one more chunk of this because now she addresses what are people's biggest questions. I'm skipping a 15 minute chunk in the middle, but two questions near the end, ask her where she gets her clients and what are her special advantages? Like how does she differentiate herself from other researchers? 
So I think these are good things to hear. Um, okay, so let me share again. I think I'm there. Okay, that didn't quite work. I, I did my screen quit. Okay. Oh, no, no, sorry, I'm in the wrong spot. Okay, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> sorry about that. Let me try this again. Where is... Um, Oh no, my tab did, it did go away. Aye, aye, aye. Okay, sorry about this. Entertain yourselves for a moment. I got to cue that screen again, it, the screen quit. Okay, so I got to get it back. Just give me a moment, I'll be there. Oh, here we go. It didn't take as long as I thought. Okay, I'm going to cue to there. I'm curious oh, in a given. Oh, so sorry, I started right away. I got to share it first. Okay, now let me go back and share. Let me share my screen and click on that and share. Okay, can you see her? Yes. Thank you so much for that. All right, here we go. Good questions. I'm curious, in a given year or like six month range, how much of your clientele or people that you've worked with or companies that you've worked with compared to just like totally new um, people or companies? That is a great question. So um, usually it's companies that I have worked with or it's people who I've worked with at a company who've moved to another company, right? So uh, I, in my consulting work, right, I worked with a lot of people and I've been doing this work for 23-ish years, depending on how you count. And so all those people have like been moving around and meeting other people and moving around and meeting other people. And so that's mostly where I do get my work from. I try to speak at conferences and um, publish here and there. I don't do enough of those things. Uh, every once in a while, someone will say, hey, you know, I heard you give this talk two years ago and now I'm at this company that has this problem and I think you can help us, right? Or I will hear about something kind of through the grapevine. Um, I'm working with a medical device startup right now where like, someone on my graduate program alumni page was looking for someone to help this person. And uh, it just kind of worked out that way. So um, lots of word of mouth. I, I know there's a class coming up on marketing and I'm actually gonna attend it uh, because I really don't have that sort of lead sales pipeline magic that a lot of other people have. And a lot of the small business advice is for B2C businesses, you know, how do you sell product X? How do you, uh, you know, do retail? How do you open your, or bring people into your mom and pop ice cream shop, right? Which is very different type of advertising and marketing than um, B2B consulting. Awesome. So how many researchers in the house? Most, yeah, excellent. I would so, love to see it. The comments are totally germane because this is the kind of work all of them. Oh, that's right, because it's the UX Research Guild. I knew that. I'm so sorry. It's very late on the East Coast, okay? <laughs> so helpful. Just coming on, having been successful for 13 years, sharing the things that have worked for you. If I have a final question, it's what do you think has made the biggest difference for you? Is it your Bentley degree? Is it all those clients consulting that kind of got you going? Like what factor, just out of curiosity, it could be different for other you know, people, but what seems to have just helped you time and time again? 
What is seem to help me? I think I'm going to say the diversity of experience. And uh, I, I imagine you may have talked a little bit already about sort of how to differentiate yourself in, in the field um, and the marketplace. And it's Sometimes it's really helpful to pick a vertical, like I'm all healthcare, I'm all automotive, I know fine fintech like the back of my hand. Um, but you know, for me to say FedEx, MasterCard, Pfizer, Federal Reserve Bank, Hyundai, you know, it's Electrolux, you know, um, I I think it gives me a little bit of street cred. Uh, the masters gives me a little bit of street cred. And then I'm also going to say speaking because you, you can't come in like a mouse as an independent consultant, right? You have to be confident uh, that you know what you're talking about, you know, that your, your client needs to be confident that they can count on you to do this work and that they don't have to handhold and that kind of thing. And I think just practicing having an opinion, you know, having a point of view on things and being willing to share it, hopefully in a clear and articulate way, uh, is really important. Okay, that's the end of that, um, that clip. Um, so other insights from what she just said? Amy Lanza, to your point, are most of her clients in network, in her in-person network or out of her, in her online network? Um, sorry, my dog's screaming, which is why I'm off camera. So apologies if he does that, but um, they seem to be in her network, which is what you said. So. I mean, this is surprising. She said it's mostly people she knows and people she knows who've moved on to other companies, you know, others that she's worked with in on her teams. So that's really such an important thing to cultivate, you know, your in-person network, people who know you, trust you, like you, like your work. Uh, but anyway, let me turn it over to you. Other ideas that you got from her. Hey, Raymond, I think yeah. she said that public speaking was another avenue for her. And I want to thank you for playing this clip of her because I saw her speak about 10 years ago and uh, she was very good. So when she says, if you have a public speaking opportunity, take it, I think, I think it's done well for her. Very good point. She highlights that specifically in terms of, you know, she says she hasn't done a lot of marketing things, but she has had some speaking opportunities. And she said years later, she'll hear back, or, you know, a year later, someone will say, I heard you speak. And now we have a need and I, I, you know, they're connecting the dots. She would be a good resource to help them. Um, so yes, cultivating those kinds of things, wherever you're strong, right? Not everyone's a public speaker. Maybe you're a better writer, but whatever that area is, you know, trying to cultivate that so that you can use that to build your, your network, your exposure. Um, other ideas that you got from her, other insights? She says not one vertical, you know, she's done a wide variety of business um, with a you know wide range of clients. She thinks that's helpful for a new client to see the breadth of her experience. So, so in terms of our earlier question, do you want depth or breadth? Either one can serve you. But Danielle's saying she thinks her breadth is useful because now a client doesn't have to just be in her vertical. That's the beauty of breadth is more company, you appeal to more companies. If you've got depth, you don't appeal to very many, but they you're very good at whatever your vertical is. And so she's saying her breadth lets her appeal to, to many different companies. Um, she does have a master's from Bentley. She brought that up. She's, that's on her list of things. So education can be important. Bentley's a great school. Um, Okay, well, maybe those are the main, <laughs> any other comments? Maybe those are the main insights. 
anyway, I am glad you got to hear some of that. In some things, she's talking way ahead of where we are, but I think that's fine. You know, it gives you a sense of, you know, things coming down the road to consider, like how to put together a bid, um, you know, what are tax ramifications, things like that. We don't spend too much time on that. But anyway, those are things you need to at least consider as a freelancer to be um, to be ready to, to make the plunge. Well, let's just close up then. Um, I'm going to share my screen again, and let's just do a last. Oh, gosh. Okay, my slides went down too. <laughs> Hang on a second. I got to bring them back. Um, Okay, I'm back. Okay. Let me share. Okay, awesome. So we just have our, our final slides. So what have you learned tonight? Hopefully in that breakout session, you got a sense of where you're strong and you know, maybe where you're weak. Um, maybe some concerns have come up about freelancing, the difficulty of finding work. I don't want to, well, I want to empower you, each of you and say you can do it. I don't want to mislead anyone into saying it's easy or it doesn't have risks. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not. <laughs> so anyway, what concerns do you have about freelancing? Um, what did you learn from the guest speaker? You know, there's no more powerful way to learn than from somebody who's just sharing their experience. So it's awesome to, that she was willing to do that. Um, and then, you know, is there someone in our group who, who might help you be able to pair up with you to help you um, reach your goals freelancing? Um, all right, so we looked at these different areas, your research skills, your networks, personal finances and other things, professional goals. Um, you can contemplate those and sort of figure out each of the sessions moving forward. We kind of focus on different things um, and help you strengthen them. But between now and the next session, which is September 20th, if you choose to return, you can kind of work in the area that you think needs the most work for you. Um, let me just say, in terms of to do's, one, um, there's a course evaluation. I would appreciate it if you fill out a course evaluation. Two, there's the spreadsheet if you want to network with others. Oh, um, Janine, maybe you can paste the link of the course evaluation. Um, just, I just put it in chat. OK, perfect. Thank you so much. OK, so there's the course eval if you're willing to do an eval. The spreadsheet we already shared. So if you want to network with all the people on this call or find one that you can um, work with, awesome. I encourage you to connect on LinkedIn, selecting a partner. And finally, there's a Slack group. It's actually relatively new, our Guild Slack group, but you're welcome to join it and stay in touch with this group in that um, Slack channel. And we've pasted some other resources. These documents we've pasted there for you to refer to. Um, and we may have other. Go ahead, Yeah, we, ha we haven't put the, the Slack um, channel information there, but we can, we can email that out. Um, but yeah, you'll notice that there's an evaluation form, other sessions um, on, on Luma that you might be interested in. And also a link if you would like to apply to lead a guild group, if you have an idea for a group. Oh, that's awesome. Janine, thank you for mentioning that. Those are all good things. Janine, by the way, is an administrative assistant with the Guild. So if you need any help, feel free to reach out to her. Janine, why don't you post your email if anybody sure. wants to reach out to you for a document or for info. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the beginning of a number of, of these small group sessions that we hope to do on Luma. So uh, keep an eye out for others that might interest you. And yes, we would love to have you um, share your experience and expertise with the group. So that's it. <laughs> I'm going to stop my share. Any final um, 
Final questions, comments? I want to thank you, Raymond, for uh, doing this. It, it's really it's really helpful for me. So thank you for facilitating this. Wow. Tim, thank you so much. I totally appreciate your being here. And um, I appreciate all of you coming. So thank you for coming. And really, the point is just to help you in your journey, you know, to fill in whatever gaps you have to get a sense of where you need to be and uh, help you get there. So if if I can help you again, come on back for another session. And otherwise, you know, it's a pleasure to meet you, to have worked with you, and let's connect for some future opportunity. All right. Hey, thank you everyone so much. Thanks, Raymond. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for Bye. coming. Janine, thanks for co-hosting. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Janine. All right. Good night, everyone. <laughs>